our ambassadors and he so kindly volunteers his time to run these webinars for us. And Chris is actually also on a three month long holiday discovering Australia and he is so kindly taken time out to stop that and to come and do this for us. So Chris, I'm so incredibly grateful and thank you just so much for doing this for us. Um, for those of you who, I'm assuming everybody here would know who Professor Gemma Figtree is, we are so fortunate to have started funding Gemma when she was an early career researcher. And she's now a professor in medicine at the University of Sydney and co-leads the cardiovascular theme for Sydney Health Partners, is the chair of the University of Sydney's multidisciplinary cardiovascular initiative, is the president of the Australian Cardiovascular Alliance and has over 190 publications in leading health journals. She's absolutely incredible. And as a practicing interventional cardiologist, she takes her insights from working directly with her patients back to the lab to focus on unraveling the mysteries behind the susceptibility and response to heart attack. It has been such a huge privilege for all of us to watch this incredible success that Gemma's had and the amazing work that she has been doing. And we're so grateful to have um, contributed to being able to help fund some of her work. So we're so excited to have Gemma here to share the findings from her latest research with everyone. So thank you so much, Gemma. My pleasure. Thanks, Jen. All right. So I will hand you over to Chris now and let you guys um, do what you do best. And I will come in. So if everyone's got any, anyone has any questions at all, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom and I will come at the end and ask all the questions um, of Gemma. So fantastic to talk to you again, Gemma. And this is a, a very interesting topic, really. Um, before we start this, you know, as usual, being just a dumb patient, I struggle with some of the jargon. What, for me, Smurfs are little funny little creatures that my kids used to play with. Tell me what a Smurf is in your world. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I mean, we've been really interested in noticing, you know, the, the quite significant number of people that come in and have heart attacks, despite no standard modifiable risk factors. And they're an interesting group. I mean, partly because they'll still manage to find a way to blame themselves for having the heart attack. And, and that's something that I think we need to change perception of right across the board. But also, they kind of reflect a degree of a population that, that must have some heightened susceptibility to developing the coronary artery disease that causes the heart attack that's beyond the things that we understand. And we're absolutely driven to try to understand what, what makes these people without traditional risk factors actually develop the same disease process. Um, we've, so we, we basically coined the term smurfless people for these individuals. And at North Shore, they actually have increased over the last decade from about 15% of the total heart attack population to around about 25% of the total population. So I don't want you to get the wrong message. It's still very important on an individual level and a community level to optimise any risk factor that's modifiable that you might have. But we shouldn't like think that that's the end of the story. We have to dig deeper. And the next 10 years, we're going to see some transformations in coronary artery disease. So before we get into that, what are the what are the, the there's four I think Smurfs. What are they? So the, the Smurfs are the modifiable risk factors and the big ones. So we have smoking, diabetes, high cholesterol, and hypertension as the big four. Okay, and how has the Australian population been going in general? I mean, there's been a lot of publicity about how to get all these down with, you know, losing weight, keeping active, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we've got drug regimes now to keep the cholesterol down. How has the Australian population been going in modifying their lifestyles and with medicine to get Smurfs down? Look, to tell you the truth, so well that we're seeing this increase in the proportion of people that don't have them. And I think that's a reflection of the GPs, the, the effort that the Heart Foundation has been putting into raising awareness and obviously the work that, that groups like Heart Research Australia have been doing at the local level here in Northern Sydney. And in fact, the fact that here in Northern Sydney, we've seen this increase for 15 to 25% likely reflects just how well patients and in the community are doing at, at, at decreasing the traditional risk factors. But importantly, it just reveals the fact that we still don't understand everything about coronary artery disease and heart attack. And in fact, 70% of people that, that just drop dead and have a cardiac arrest or, or in the community actually are due to, to plaques in the arteries that they've not been aware of until the time they actually have that. And so we need to actually move beyond algorithms that are 
mixing up probability based on risk factors to actually try to come up with a marker, ideally in the blood, that actually reflects that early disease process that builds up for a number of years before someone can have a catastrophic, catastrophic event. So we, we all, I think all of us have known people who are fit as a scrub bull. They, you know, the, the envy of all of us, they run 5Ks every day. They, you know, they, they never drink, they never eat. They don't do anything that, that the rest of us might enjoy. And then they suddenly drop dead, uh, you know, at yeah. the age of 48 or 50. So, I mean, um, why do so many of these actually drop dead as against a heart attack, even though we've got the whole atami, salami, all the things in case which works with people like me, but why doesn't it work with those people? Well, look, I mean, people with risk factors that have a blocked artery in the community still have a high probability of, well, moderate probability of not making it to hospital. So we obviously get to know the people that do make it to hospital with blocked arteries and, you know, suffering often cardiac arrest, but resuscitated appropriately. Um, but the, the, what's interesting is this, the, the difference between actually having your heart stop when you have a heart attack, which we call a cardiac arrest, is really to do with this, a rhythmic component where you, you basically your normal rhythm becomes actually very abnormal because of the electricity becoming disturbed by the, the very abnormal um, factors of the heart attack where basically the heart goes into a very, very fast disorganized rhythm called ventricular fibrillation. That's what we call a shockable rhythm. So if someone's around and you're in it, your heart stops, but if someone shocks you, it can put it back to your normal rhythm. And so in the community, we're obviously making big efforts to try to raise awareness around cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR, but also defibrillation and the importance of that. But what's interesting in terms of who gets that arrhythmia when they've got a blocked artery versus who doesn't is something we don't completely understand. The work that we've just had published in The Lancet does suggest that the people that have no risk factors to cause their coronary artery disease who suffer heart attack at a higher risk of actually having sudden cardiac death or an arrhythmic event. And so it may be that whatever heightens their susceptibility to developing the plaque in the arteries also reflects a heightened susceptibility to, to, to some of these things that drive the nasty rhythms. And so we don't understand this at all yet, but it just raises the, the, the really important message that um, you know, heart disease is not all self-induced. Even in the people that have medium levels of risk factors, there's plenty of people that do exactly the same to, them, to themselves. Or in fact, many of these people don't necessarily do much wrong at all, but can have a high, a high cholesterol or a high blood pressure that's genetically determined or, or in other ways, perhaps through the environment that we don't completely understand. And so I'm really passionate about making sure patients with heart disease don't blame themselves um, for this. Having said that, I also try to help them make the most of all of the different, both lifestyle as well as pharmacotherapy or drug therapy to try to reduce their chance of second events. Yeah, but I mean, if we got a choice between eating 400 gram steaks and, and having a nice beer every night, and having a heart attack that you can fix or not having any of those things and dropping dead from a cardiac arrest. I know which way I'm going. In fact, I'll call my wife to get the steak on now. But, <laughs> you know, I'm assuming that a lot of these Smurfs are also involved in whether you have this cardiac arrest or not. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously the biggest cause of cardiac arrest is coronary artery disease and still the biggest causes of coronary artery disease in the community is actually the traditional risk factors. And so you definitely don't, don't we don't want people to meet, misread this and actually go out there and try to get risk factors because that's not going to help. Um, we want to make sure everyone has reduced their, their risk factors as much as possible. But if you do have the predisposition to developing plaque in the absence of coronary disease, we actually think that we need to go even harder at lowering the traditional risk factors in those individuals. Um, because it's, it's almost like it's a downstream factor where you've got things attacking the artery, but these people have a heightened susceptibility to actually developing the plaque. And I like to make the analogy of the fact that the plaque's a bit like a pimple on the inside of someone's artery. And for a teenager that's susceptible to pimples, despite actually taking very good care of their skin, that's really unfortunate. Uh, and so our job is obviously to make even better care of that skin or the blood vessel and make sure that we, we really settle things down before it's dangerous. 
So Gemma, I had my heart attack at the age of 52. Um, in retrospect, I wasn't smurfless, but at the time I thought I was, along with immortality and all the other things you feel when you're 52. Um, and, um, but so I, I was relatively young. Um, are these smurfless heart attacks or, or cardiac events more common in young people? And why is that? Yeah, they seem to not have much of an interaction with age. I mean, age is still actually the biggest risk factor. It's just not, we don't call it a smurf because it's not modifiable at this point, unfortunately. Um, so certainly, you know, age is a major risk factor. But I'd like to think that, you know, you look at a lot of other animal species and we're very unusual in terms of where the fact that we, we do develop atherosclerosis um, and, and many others don't get coronary artery disease and don't have this, this susceptibility to, to, to the disease process. So I think, you know, age shouldn't be seen as an inevitable cause of heart disease, but it is the biggest risk factor. So in terms of the question is, is it more common in young people to have people that are smurfless having heart attacks? It's not actually the case. It's equal across the ages. Um, but obviously, over overall, we're getting an, you know, at, at older ages, age is an important contribution to this. Well, now, when I was reading some of the, these papers that you've put together and, and other papers, I noticed the other comment they make is that the risk of death amongst women is three times higher than the risk of death amongst men in these smurfless, I love that word, smurfless um, heart attack group. Uh, why is that? Is there some estrogenic involvement? Are people's sex harmons have to do with it? Or how? Why does, what happens there? Look, we don't know. It, the, the exact figure is that it's... So men that have at least one risk factor in this Swedish cohort over a 15-year period had about a 6% chance of being dead at 30 days. Um, women who... Ha, so men, men that had no risk factors compared to men that had risk factors had about a 50% increase in mortality, which was 9%. But women with no risk factors actually had an 18% chance of being um, dead at, at 30 days. And so this was driven by this nasty rhythm that I mentioned, and we don't understand why it is, although it might actually be kind of the opposite of what you're saying in a sense. It's that women actually do tend to have a bit of protection against this process. But in fact, we, if you, have, if you develop coronary disease in the absence of risk factors, and despite being a female, you actually do have some kind of mechanisms that, that, that is driving, it's kind of an inflammatory or a host response that we don't understand that might always, may also be associated with a heightened responsibility, you know, susceptibility to this rhythm abnormality. But we don't know the answer. What it does highlight is that women, full stop, actually do get much worse outcomes in the first 30 days after heart attack. And one thing that we did identify is that women were getting a lot less of the evidence-based treatment than men were. And so one possibility is that the heightened mortality is just that they're not getting enough of the, the medication that we know should protect them from death. And yet I've always thought men were the ones who are all blokey and I don't need to go to hospital, and women were the ones saying, you need to go to hospitals, but they don't apply that to themselves. Well, interestingly, that was a, a hypothesis that many people asked us to test. And in fact, the women were getting to the hospital quicker than men, but actually getting slower um, to the cath lab. So it's actually not the women turning up late. It's actually the, the hospital service being a little bit more questioning about whether it's hard or not. And so are we saying we've got a misogynistic hospital service. Don't believe it. So this is the Swedes, don't forget. And it is over the last 15 years. Um, and so it may be that things are improving with better education but it does highlight the importance of making sure we have equitable access to the best possible treatments, whether you're male or female or anything else. So, Gemma, um, I've heard you say we don't understand and we don't know about 20 times so far in this interview. Um, that sounds like a lot of research and therefore we, we you know, Heart Research Australia has got a lot of work ahead of it. You know, it's really exciting because actually, you know, there is this slight perception in the community that heart disease is all solved. And also that really this other component of it, this self-blame and also or people thinking that it's a self-induced condition, um, you know, very similar risk factors that drive heart disease actually increase people's susceptibility 
to, to cancer, to dementia, and to many other things like this. And we don't have quite that feeling of self-blame on those. And I don't know yourself, Chris, whether you actually, you know, first of all, obviously you, you thought that this you were potentially smurfless, but you didn't know the word. Um, but did you actually wonder whether or not there was a degree of something you'd done to cause the heart disease? Or did you, you were actually... Not, not well, my immediate conclusion, I mean, I'd been, you know, uh, early, you know, uh, like 20 years before my attack, I was very fit, you know, I was um, in the army, I was playing a lot of rugby, I was running around, and I still think, I think I thought I was in that era. I mean, I still kept myself fit, but, you know, obviously not to the degree, but you still had that feeling of immortality, and it was a shock to me. I mean, heart attacks were things that happened to other people. So I'm saying, well, despite me doing all that, I'm still lying here in hospital. I don't understand that. So then I was blaming the fact that I fell into cold water and it was a little boat I fell out of fault. So we burnt the boat and, you know, all that sort of thing. So you do look for reasons because um, you, you don't know why that is. And I guess that brings me to my next question, because in my world of animal science, the autoimmune system is so important. In our case, we're looking for production from animals and any energy they take away from production to keep themselves from getting sick is just money out of your pocket being quite i mean obviously we're in the business of producing food um so my question is as a hypothesis do you think the autoimmune system uh, and the strength of that has anything to do with um preventing um heart attacks when all of those other smurfs aren't present yeah well thanks chris i mean Absolutely. The infl inflammatory cascade that's involved in both causing coronary artery disease as well as actually re responding to coronary artery disease is, is really interesting. So we know inflammation plays a big role and we know each individual often has the different, you know, different levels of inflammation depending on what, what you do to them, <laughs> whether or not you've got an infection or anything else like that. Um, and obviously the autoimmune just means that that, that, that it something has set up an, an immune response that's actually acting against self and so in the case in this case we need to move beyond some of the very very basic measures of inflammation that we have there's a, a thing called a c-reactive protein that's a very non-specific measure of inflammation but we know it's highly associated with susceptibility to heart attack um, but we could go so much better. And one of the most exciting programs that really has been seeded by Heart Research Australia, but now has funding from NHMRC and the Medical Research Future Fund is something called the BioHeart Study. And um, this is a study where we're actually collecting blood from uh, aiming for 7,000 individuals, 5,000 who have cardiac CT and have really good demonstration of the amount of plaque in their arteries and 2,000 who come through with heart attacks. And we take the thousands of small molecules that are in their blood and also some of the different immune subpopulations, so the different immune cells in the blood. And we actually have numerous technological platforms that actually can look at these in completely unbiased ways without having to know what the molecule does. And from that, we actually then use machine learning like approaches to try to identify either signals that are involved in the causality of the coronary disease or actually signals that I think would be really exciting that actually might reflect the disease itself. So that would be a bit like a kind of PSA of coronary disease that if you got an early little rise a few years before actually you're at risk of having an event, that would actually really greatly contribute to the ability to, to give effective medication to these individuals to prevent the progression of disease and prevent heart attack. What about work with the genome? Yeah, so the gene is, genome is amazing. I mean, every year we keep getting more and more fancy combinations of something called single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are these little, they're little Thanks, tiny. Gemma. That, that's really good. What, just tell me what that means. So there are hundreds of thousands of different variants across the genome that actually contribute to giving a score that has a probability of predicting disease. So this is a clever artificial intelligence people pulling in the fact that people had disease with their genome. What's challenging is to actually unravel what this means at an individual level. And we're now getting to the point where we hopefully can use it without necessarily understanding it. Um, it is fascinating that humans of all of those different variants that are associated with heart disease, 
most of the, the, the infrequent alleles are actually the protective ones. And so the variants themselves are actually ones that are very common in human race, and they're the ones associated with disease. So what we can do is add up the, all of these different things and come up with a score that then gives you a probability, basically, that is completely complementary to a traditional risk score. No one's actually been properly putting this into, you know, the GP primary health care check yet. But I think it is something that we'll see over the next five years help in that risk, early risk identification and not necessarily understanding all of why it works, but just the fact that it, it, it likely is going to be able to help us identify a subset of individuals who we wouldn't otherwise know were at risk. And we need to then obviously prove that we can protect them from heart attack. And so this is a much of ongoing work right across the globe. But it's, it's slightly different to the other work we're doing, which is more looking at proteins and metabolites in the blood that are actually kind of an interaction of the host, the environment and the genome. And, and that bit is something that I think is going to give you probably a bit more of a dynamic measure of the individual's response. So for those of us who don't have SMERS, I mean, in my case, I cheat because you guys give me things to keep my blood pressure down, keep my cholesterol down, um, obviously careful with my diet and I, I've never smoked, etc. So what can we do to actually reduce our risk of these alternative events that are not tied up with those things? Look, it's still ultimately tied up with the plaque. And if, even if you don't have risk factors, the same medication that work in people that do have high cholesterol or hypertension actually do have direct benefits on the blood vessel. And interestingly, in work that's actually unpublished, we see that the people with no, not, no level of, like a minimal cholesterol, who actually take a statin, have a, an increased relative benefit to it than the people that, 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 this is after you've had an event. So you've developed atherosclerosis without a high cholesterol, but then lowering the cholesterol further with the statin actually has beneficial effects, even if you didn't have a high risk factor based on community levels to start with. So I, I know that sounds confusing, but the tablets that we know prevent progression in individuals with those risk factors actually also do have benefits in people without risk factors that go above a traditional threshold. So maybe we should put aspirin and clopidogrel in the water then, like fluoride. Uh, I think there's probably a slightly better argument. Well, we know that aspirin in primary prevention is actually not very evidence-based at all. Um, before we had other things that we could do to modify people's risk, aspirin actually did was thought to prevent heart attack at a primary prevention level. So this is at people with never had an event before. <clears throat> but a really big study in Australia actually demonstrated that if you randomise people to aspirin or placebo who were, had a variety of level of risk, um, and we're an older population, it did not reduce heart attack in a manner that was significant enough to outweigh the bad effects of bleeding in the stomach. That's a completely different kettle of fish to aspirin in someone that has had an event where absolutely it's evidence-based. So Gemma, there's been, I know, some work on the acute causes of heart attacks done at the Colling Institute um, and things like bereavement, you know, sudden sudden shocks, um, lifting heavy weights. There's been a whole range of things which have been found that can trigger a heart attack in someone who didn't know they were susceptible. Um, is there, and I've asked this to of, of Dr. Koza in the last interview as well, is there any evidence to suggest that we should all cart around a little packet of, of pills and when we are in one of those events, particularly a bereavement, you know, you suddenly lose your partner or your parent and therefore you're suddenly under that stress that prophylactically you use what would be normally given after you'd had the heart attack to prevent the heart attack occurring in the first place. Yeah, I mean, there's multiple levels of prevention, obviously preventing the development of, of plaque or atherosclerosis in the artery itself is is a longer term situation but many people in the community have plaque that they're unaware of where if they then have an acute bereavement or stressful situation may actually trigger plaque rupture and there's quite there's very good evidence that that such things can happen there's a number of different kind of triggers that can happen but usually against the background of actually having that plaque in the first place there is other evidence, obviously, that chronic stress can actually increase the susceptibility to the plaque in the first place. But back to your question, I mean, 
you know, obviously Professor Toffler is actually one of the leading researchers in the world in this area, along with Tom Buckley and the team. And they certainly have done a feasibility study to suggest that this is um, possible, that people are able to, to carry a pill and take it at the time and that it's well tolerated. Um, you actually, it's a very difficult study to really to do in terms of actually a long-term large randomised trial to actually really prove beyond a doubt that this is actually going to reduce death. Right. Well, I mean, I guess all I can say, we're, I guess we're coming towards the end of this interview, but, you know, I'm sitting out here in this gorgeous place. You can hear the crows in the background. Um, I wouldn't be here if all the work you guys are doing and have done in the past hadn't allowed me to do that. If Atami hadn't been there, funded by Heart Research Australia, if you guys hadn't been waiting in the hospital when I arrived, you know, from falling out of the boat, um, you know, I would have missed this. I would have missed my grandchildren. I would have missed everything in life that's so so rewarding when you get to this end of life i mean all you can say is that the work you're doing in terms of lifestyle uh, and in terms of the quality of life as well as death is just absolutely critical if we want to enjoy a full life um, I get frustrated with the emphasis we sometimes have put on things which are no less critical, but no more critical, and yet they seem to get an emphasis, and we do take a lot of this heart information for granted. So um, I, I still remember that cardiologist conference you had around the Super uh, Hero series, and you came along as Wonder Woman, and I thought, well, there was never a more appropriate garb. So. <laughs> You've been our Wonder Woman today. Uh, I really Absolutely. appreciate the chance to pick your brains about that. And um, I'm happy, if, Jim and Jenny, if you've got any questions, that uh, we maybe do questions with, of, yeah. from what Jim said. Yeah, sure. So um, I haven't got any questions from the um, people in here. I don't know whether because you're the host now, Gemma, whether you got any. No, mm -hmm. but um, Actually, maybe, I no, I've got no open questions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I should look in the Q&A, shouldn't I? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I do have questions, So, So in terms of um, women, you said that it is less likely that women are prescribed medication on leaving in terms of like statins and beta blockers and so on. Should women be, I guess, demanding these? If, they, if, a, if a female turns up to hospital, takes, you know, longer to get through the triage as maybe a man or a maybe she gets in as, as she does. Mm -hmm. um, if she's leaving and there ha hasn't been prescribed anything, should she be saying, I would like to have, you know, this prescribed to me before I leave? Yeah, look, I mean, I think just firstly to say that the the main evidence that we've been quoting that was published in The Lancet came from the Swed Swedish cohort, yeah. and it also covered over a 15-year period. Yeah. And I think the heightened awareness, you know, across the world, hopefully has seen some improvement and we need to be to be addressing, you know, hopefully seeing that. I mean, interestingly, one of the other challenges with women is that the clinical trials that we base this evidence off often are very underrepresented with women in the first place. And that actually stems back to some really interesting um, issues initially where women were, were banned from being part of clinical trials in case, you know, thoughts of fertility and things like this, mm -hmm. you know, new drugs don't want to don't mess with that. But the, and then I think, you know, there was more ideas that actually having a more homogenous study cohort would actually be better. And so that was a big problem. Uh, but it's only recently that we've really had a mandate, um, you know, really from, from the leadership across the world that we have to have, you know, ideally at least equal representation of women to what we see in the disease entity and also making sure that we have enough power in the study to hopefully be able to get an idea about the subgroup response to the tablet. And so that's my long-winded answer in saying that, well, you know, yes, we, we know that these tablets do work in women. Um, women, by all means, should have, you know, understand their disease, understand why they're taking tablets and also what other options might have been available for them. Yeah. And I think that's probably a better way than actually then, you know, demanding as such. But, but by understanding what, what is the best evidence-based treatment, um, which certainly in our institution is done very well by not just the junior doctors and the nurses, and yeah. but also the, the cardiac rehab do a very good job. Yeah, and I also had a question in terms of cardiac rehab. Did you did your study include cardiac? Because I know you were looking particularly about people who've had medication afterwards. Was cardiac rehab included in that? Because I know that's a really prominent thing in terms of people getting second heart attacks after on and um, fatality afterwards. Yeah, so the, I mean, basically, sorry, just to re-emphasise, cardiac 
being referred and taking up the opportunity to go to Cadbury. Two very different things. Is, is very, so a lot of people can be referred and not take it up, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we need to get better at actually personalising what we're trying to achieve with cardiac rehab. There's obviously the educational components and there's also the getting your confidence back with um, exercise, exercise. And, and everyday activity. Um, but the educational piece and giving people the, the empowerment to really understand why they're taking their tablets and what opportunity they've got to optimise their vascular health into the future is a really major component of it. And we know that being attending and completing cardiac rehab is associated very strongly with improved outcome yeah. and reduced events. So I'm not sure I answered the question there, but hopefully I, I touched on it. We're getting lots of questions. Yes. Now. Yep. So yeah, no, um, I'm, I'm just going to go through some of these questions. So um, one of the ones that I do actually get a lot asked a lot personally is how do people get involved in your study, Gemma? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I won't say have a heart attack because that's a bad way. <laughs> yeah. So someone um, said here that she had a heart, she was from Melbourne, had a heart attack and wanted to know how she could get involved in your study. Yeah. Well, look, without knowing, obviously, whether you had any of the modifiable risk factors, um, at the moment, the main referral base is people coming in either having clinically indicated cardiac CT or having have a heart attack and we actually, for all of those, take people with and without risk factors and then yep. look at people without risk factors versus the rest. Yep. The people that have actually had events either at really young age or without modifiable risk factors. So obviously she having... She said a, she was 38. Yes. Some people might be 38 and have a cholesterol... Oh, she's got no, no risk factors. <laughs> yeah, definitely get in touch because the best way of doing this is actually our new... So we've just had a, an NH and MRC... Um, centre of research excellence that actually is going to be run across Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide. And so there'll be three main hubs and we actually have a clinic that we're setting up to think about rarer causes that we might look for. Um, think things like there's a lipoprotein little a, there's actually some really interesting data coming out um, about other modifiable components. There's environmental things to think about too, but we actually have a registry where you can come on board. Um, you can give blood and become part of the BioHeart study for smurfless people that are attached to this CRE. And um, we will actually just follow the red, we will follow a consensus clinical pathway that we have for the best diagnostic tests that we do in people that have got this really unexpected disease and also think about what best treatments to do. And, and as I was saying, one thing that really is fascinating is in the clinical trials, they don't actually look at the outcomes of individuals that don't have traditional risk factors. They're actually completely invisible in clinical trials. So we don't really know, although we recent data suggests that they, tablets that we know from these studies work even better in people without traditional risk factors, we think. So anyway, the long and the short of it is get in touch. Um, we, it's perfect timing because this Centre of Research Excellence is literally just kicking off and you can be involved in part of the blood, the biobank stuff side of it, as well as actually um, the registry. Do you have a link for the registry that people could, or do you think? I don't yet, because it's, it's literally just going through ethics. We got, um, you know, the, the funding was only announced about um, three or four months ago, and, um, you know, it takes a little bit of time. Research is, is a, yeah. a, a long game, but the rest, you know, it is. it means that we can actually take people that have been, you know, had their event five or 10 years ago yeah. that are smurfless who can actually still come to the clinic and actually find out more about what might have tr triggered it, yeah. but also be part of a, a growing cohort of patients who are willing to kind of help us understand the missing yeah. biology of coronary artery disease. All right, so I'll show you. Yep. Jenny, I, can I just say there's a question come in here from someone, um, a basic question, I suppose. We talk about plaques in relation to a lot of things, your teeth, um, Alzheimer's disease, your heart, are these all different plaques or are they the same sort of thing? No, they're very different. Um, same sort of thing in terms of things you don't want, basically. <laughs> That's the common element. But um, but plaque in the arteries is is really complex. It, it, it starts off with a bit of, first of all, dysfunction in the lining of the vessel that, and allows for the, the cholesterol to come in and macrophages, which are some white cells that, that gobble up the cholesterol and actually then become inflamed. And that sets up this thing that, as I said, is a bit like a pimple on the inside of the artery. And that's the dangerous period where you have this very, you know, almost explosive um, process happening on the inside. If that pops, it's a bit like, a, you know, the pimple popping where the actual gooey component in the middle can actually then trigger the blood to clot. 
And that's what an acute heart attack is. You can then have much more old scarred plaque that actually is much more stable and a lot safer than actually that unsafe, um, more dewy plaque. So someone else so along there, those there's lines, also, sorry, there's said, also, a question, sorry. A question, sorry. That um, he had plaque some plaque 10 years ago, should he be checked, um, should she be checked periodically to make sure that it hasn't become worse? So that's a really interesting question. People would love to, you know, the only way you can really check the plaque is to actually image it, either non-invasively with a CT, and you can either do it, you know, indirectly with a calcium score or with, with contrast, but that's not indicated if people are asymptomatic. The main issue is making sure people who have plaque early on are actually on the best treatment and are at target with their, their, with their thresholds that they're trying to get below. If they're not, the best evidence is actually to just crank things up till they are and to, to do that. And then make sure you're, not, you're really not ignoring any symptoms that might be suggestive that the plaque has narrowed enough to cause muscle ischemia or muscle pain related to not getting enough blood. Um, we've had um, a so, few questions. Sorry, Chris. Do you want yeah, to... I was just going to say, Gemma, uh, uh, there's some few questions of people asking about the COVID. COVID, vaccine. that was my, yeah. Yeah, and um, I mean, the, the essence of them, I suppose, relation to what we've been talking about here, um, because there's been so much talk about clotting, I think everyone now understands the yeah. risk is extremely low. But the question is, if you've had a stent, which is a sort of a, an unnatural part that's been put in, in your heart, I always think it's a bit like those those cross wire things you see in hoses to stop them collapsing. Um, if you've had one of those, does that make the problem more acute in terms of the possibility of a clot or it's irrelevant? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, you're much better off asking a haematologist or probably a general practitioner, actually. But um, really, there's, there's two separate layers here. One is, are you at risk of getting this very rare condition? At a high, at, are you at increased risk if you have a stent of getting this condition? And I, I believe that the answer is no, because it's an immune-mediated thing. And interestingly, you know, one of the worst complications in if you get COVID is a very similar situation where you kind of get this this clotting situation in, in particularly in the small vessels and so it's really interesting that 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 is seen with the vaccine and you know you do have to wonder whether the people that are actually at risk of getting this are actually also the ones of, at risk of getting really bad complications from the disease itself and I don't know that for sure but I mean the, the, the issue about the stent is if you do get this issue of platelet activation and, and clotting you, you, you may be at heightened complication from having it, but I don't know that that's actually been proven. So I think the general really conservative approach is that, I mean, I, I, I have previously been saying to my patients with stents that are otherwise well with good vascular control, that the, the, the risk benefit ratio is such that, you know, I would still be having it. But I know that the GPs are under enormous amount of pressure to be answering these questions that we just don't have evidence for. So. I think that just we're very lucky in Australia that the health system is able to identify this early if it happens. Everybody's got heightened awareness for it. And I think the good news is that if you do, do you know, get the complication, we're, we're most likely to be able to do a very good job at treating it. Great. Um, so another question, do beta blockers have a protective effect on the heart? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, Certainly, beta blockers have been thought to, to, to save an enormous number of lives. It's largely when people have actually had a heart attack and got some damage to the heart muscle that we see the greatest benefit. And so also in the early phases after heart attack, the, the beta blockers are able to protect against the nasty rhythms that we see that can cause death immediately after a heart attack, or in fact, cause death before people even get to the hospital where that beta blocker that we might have got if we were in the bereavement study might have actually helped reduce that, that probability. So beta blockers definitely have evidence. The area where people are questioning whether we need to give it is in people that have had a heart attack but had very rapid treatment and got good reperfusion or blood flow back to their heart with minimal damage to the heart muscle. And in that setting, people do, you know, the, the relative benefit of being on it versus any potential side effects is, is less strong. And in fact, you know, after the first three months, it, it's probably um, something that is often taken off the, the medication list. Great. Um, we've got, I haven't been able to get to all of the questions. Do we have time for some more questions or should we, do you need to take off, Gemma? 
No, I've got time for more. I'm actually just thinking in terms of the link, what I can do is um, just give you an email. of. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Do I send it to the panellist or send it to everybody? Um, do you want to just email it to me and then yep. I can send it out with the email for the link? Yep. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you Michael Gray, who's our, yep. our research coordinator. Who Fantastic. Can do that, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so someone has mentioned that for people who are very fit, healthy, and they suffer a sudden ca cardiac arrest, what sort of, do you know what percentage of these people would have sort of undetected plaque and what the basis for the undetected plaque would be in terms of them having a cardiac arrest? Uh, hang on, I'm just trying to read the question at the same time. There's a complicated one. Hang on, which yeah. <laughs> Very, very bottom, Jessica Marie. Thank you for, for the people who are fit and healthy and suffocated. Do you know percentage of an undetected plaque? So, so if you're talking, the definition of premature cardiac arrests or premature, you know, cardiovascular death is, you know, obviously depends on where you sit in your age group. But if you look at everybody under the age of 70 who is otherwise fit and well and running around without any symptoms, 70% of sudden cardiac death in that group are atherosclerotic. So plaque in the arteries that have caused a rupture and a heart attack. Um, the other causes can be a cardiomyopathy, so a heart muscle problem, or a rarer cause such as those associated with genetic abnormalities in iron channels and things like that. Um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is another one that can affect athletes as well. Um, and so but they're a rarer part of the pie, but they're also really important because Often they can be inheritable or they can be prevented if we pick them up early and give people the right thing. So all what the golden dream of all of the, these things is to actually pick things up earlier. And the reason that the, the atherosclerosis is such an attractive one for us to tackle in the next five years, not only is it the biggest killer in the world, and we really stood stop, we move moved beyond guessing based on, on probability and risk factors to actually having a marker that actually told us of the disease burden and ideally actually the disease activity because there's two different things. One is you obviously develop disease, but if you suddenly then start taking the right tablets, the actual risk goes, you know, right, right tablets, right lifestyle, the risk goes down pretty quickly and the plaque can stabilise and the risk of heart attack is actually a lot less despite the fact that the plaque never goes away. And so that's what we're really aiming to do. And I think... Um, it definitely will have a big impact, not just in the older population, but certainly in the younger population. And um, we really hope to to make some big big um, gains in there. And massive thanks to everybody that supported Heart Research Australia and our work to get there. Yeah, no, we're very, very grateful to all the donors who have been able to help us fund fund you from early career research today. So it's been it's been wonderful and it's been so great seeing all of the wonderful work that you've been doing. And um, thank you so much, Gemma and Chris, for taking the time to be with us today. And apologies to everybody who, who were there part part of our um, technical difficulties at the very beginning. But um, we're so grateful to have had um, everyone come and join us. And I will be sending a link to the recording um, in an email after this to everyone who signed up. And I'll also include this email address that Gemma has shared with me about being involved in her study. So um, do you have, guys have any other points so it's all good? No, we should have given you a beta blocker at the beginning of the year. Uh... Oh, I needed it. I needed it. If I'd had that pill that um, Chris had been talking about that Jeff has been studying, I think I would have needed to have popped that. I was incredibly stressed. But no, I'm very glad it's all worked out and everyone got to hear about your incredible work. So thank you so much, Gemma. And thank you, Chris, for taking time away from your incredible holiday. Go Thanks, back Chris. and enjoy it and have fun. Okay. Thanks no so much, guys. Bye. Thank you.